Uh, before we start, I, I so um, I have an example of um, we talked last week about how uh, I have some apps that I don't really have a test environment and I kind of should. Um, they're shiny app packages. And so it would be good when I do a pull request to deploy to a, you know, not the production version of the app and then, uh, you know, and then actually deploy when I, uh, when I merge it in. So going to, let's see, I'm going to hopefully be able to show this. I'm doing it by showing the whole screen, which might get some weird artifacts, we will see. Um, yeah, I think that's the way to go. Okay, hopefully I'm sharing what I think I am sharing. So, all right, so this is the um, R4DS community Shiny Apps dashboard. And just to show you, I've got Shiny Slack and Shiny Slack test. So this is Shiny Slack's a package that I have for basically for, for all the R4DS stuff to integrate Shiny and Slack. So we can use our Slack login to authenticate for an app. Um, and just to give you, so the, oops, uh, yeah, there we go. The app itself, all it does is uh, it, I have to log in, but I, I already have the cookie, I'm logged in, and then it looks up my name. And that's all it does just to show that it's actually connecting to Slack. Um, and likewise, Shiny Slack test is exactly the same thing right now because uh, they have been merged together. Uh, so I have this pull request that I made a change um, and I'm going to kick it off. And in theory, it should deploy to Shiny Slack test and then it should deploy to Shiny Slack once I merge it in. And so I'm gonna kick it off so we can see it kind of start and it'll take a second to show me, there we go. It's thinking or it's doing the, the check and now we'll leave it to go because it's going to take a little while. Well, and then the other thing that I will do is show you what it does. Uh, so on the check, it does. There are some standard um, R things. Well, so this is check out the, um, you know, the code. Set up R. Um, I actually probably should change that to four two one. And it also installs RS Connect, and then it um, creates this R environment which uh, show, yeah, is not showing anything secret, good. <laughs> I don't have to edit the video, but it loads a secret to put into the R environment and then uh, some other settings and then it deploys the app. And so I have this R environment fake that it's, so it has this key. Uh, that's the important thing that um, it uses just to encrypt the cookie that it's creating uh, through this whole process. And so, uh, yeah, so that's all the interesting stuff. I had to like explicitly tell it whether it's on test or not. And so that's part of what's going in here. Is it, uh, in the PR, it says to go to shiny Slack test in both of these places. And then once it merges into me main, it does the same thing, but it goes to shiny Slack instead of shiny Slack test. So we will, uh, let it go. Is it, let's see. Just reload. Um, <laughs> in theory, if I just reload, it'll, uh, yeah, show us where we are. So yeah, it's uh, it's installing dependencies. This will take a little while. So we'll come back to this at the end and make sure that it has done what I think it has done. Actually, it's already doing the push, but okay, we'll come back in a minute. <laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking Thanks, like not underscore the underscore real underscore password <laughs> would be quite a good password. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I feel like the uh, false gets in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thankfully, you know, thankfully it does hide secrets. That's a nice thing about uh, GitHub that you can set up secrets and it'll load them in in mm -hmm. the uh, GitHub actions. Um, and so, and, and see it like it shows you. Here it's like, oh, don't let's not load those. Let's not display those things. Um, I didn't actually notice. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing in case I did. Now I need to see if I actually showed uh, anything there. No, okay, yes, because the the token for RS Connect <laughs> is also a Chinese select or a, a GitHub secret. 
yeah i think everything that seemed like it should be a secret <laughs> was a secret um i have had a couple of book clubs where someone will say oh god john can you edit out like about 15 minutes in i showed something okay. and uh yeah so fortunately i don't think any of those has made it onto the youtube channel but that shows you why it's good to have a some sort of test <laughs> it's just hard to get people to actually mm -hmm. check to make sure oh crap <laughs> did i show something anyway so i think we're good um and then like i said at the end i'll make sure that it has worked and then show you how it did and actually it is already finished so never mind i'm going to go ahead and pull this up um yeah. and we can go over to let's see so I'll, I'll reshare screen two. All right, so we can see, hopefully you're seeing that the deployed date for Shiny Slack mm -hmm. test is now today. Um, and that is this one. And so when I reload, all, all I wanna do is make sure that it worked. And actually in this case, the thing that I did should be putting a thing in the log and I'm gonna stop sharing for a second because I don't know what the log shows. Uh, and then the I real secret. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Does it show me? Uh, good timing from Tanashi as well. Oh. Huh. And it's not showing me what I thought it should show me in the log. So I am not going to merge this into main yet. I actually uh, use this. Um. What the change was supposed to do is when it. Uh, when it loads the, oh, that was actually, it's only doing it when I store the cookie. Okay, I need to do something to test it. Anyway, I, I have it, you know, I'm actually using it. So I have the test environment to actually see, did the thing, did the yeah. change do what I thought it was gonna do? And now, uh, you didn't break works, production. Exactly, so oh, thank did you, you did to you this book. Implement a, a test environment? I did, uh, you just That's missed. Fantastic. The setup, I, I pushed a pull request to the test and then the test environment automatically deployed. And I stopped sharing because I didn't want to risk, uh, I didn't know what was going to be in the log, <laughs> but. Um, I, okay, no need no need to explain now. I, I can go back to the video um, when yeah. it's posted. Look at it, I'm so excited. Please frame so it, great. see if you do get the secrets or not from you know the, the split second that we might get when it was deployed. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't, so it doesn't show the secret, thankfully. Um, and <laughs> let me see. So I want to see if I can get this set up. So if I go to shiny, yeah, there we go. Shiny apps and I delete the existing cookie. And then. Um, uh, by the way, John, as you do this, you know, the yeah. main UI design of this shiny app, is are these like JavaScript widgets kind of thing? Or... Uh, shiny apps in general? Or... No, like your your shiny dashboard here. Oh, um, so the ones I they all are using uh, mostly off the shelf shiny um, functions, which are basically JavaScript and HTML and CSS all wrapped together. And then so now I think yeah I'm reshowing this. This is the the test environment. I have my really uh, ugly uh, UI that is just to sign in and. I'm going to tell it yes, uh, in theory, there we go. All right, and now, like I said, nice. um, there, yeah, it worked. And if we look at the log now, oops, I need to probably re-log in. Uh, hopefully it's not gonna make me do a two-factor or anything. Okay, good. So uh, the new log, there's all kinds of crap that I'm still trying to get cleared out. There we go. This is the new thing, shiny Slack key found encrypting string. So, oh, that's fantastic. Because I, I have this function that encrypts if it finds something in the environment variable and then doesn't yeah. encrypt if it doesn't find that thing. And so now I added this where if it finds the environment variable, it gives this like happy message. If it doesn't find the environment variable, it gives a warning saying, hey, you know, uh, I didn't find this this key, so I'm passing it in plain text. Um, so cool, it worked. Uh, and now, so this is, uh, so I tweeted about this the other day that I have this pathological thing that I have all these projects where I'm the only person that works on them, but I set them up where they need a review. 
uh, mm. because that's what I do on all my projects is they need a review. And it kind of makes me yeah, stop. I, I, I agree. Like, I think it's good practice. Like I pretend to review it and then I click the checkbox, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, um, yeah. uh, you know, I check, make sure that the changes that I think are there are there. Um, okay. That's what I think it is, but I can't review my own work. So I have to tell it, <laughs> okay, override the review and squash. No, no, this, is, this is super good, good practice. <laughs> I, I completely agree with it. And I mean, you know, as a segue, um, <laughs> this is good because anytime that uh, you have to work with an actual uh, yes. ML ops person, you <laughs> know the secrets, you, you know all the pathways. Yeah. And, and like at work, there are always at least two of us working on things and we review each other's. And so I just carry over the practice to my, right. my own stuff. Um, but like I said, it's crazy because like literally every time I'm clicking that box. Um, but then I'm yeah. like that on the R for DS things. Uh, when other people submit things, it requires a review. So then I review actually do review those. Um, yeah, yeah. it's really, like I think as Tanasha said, it's really good practice, right? But I'm the sort of person who like has a commit message that says fixing the typos typo. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. <I> just, <laughs> iterate fast, break stuff, and then have to fix it. So it would be great to do this, but I think. Takes yeah, maybe a certain type of person to oh. review their own, you know, PR in the same way. My my most else. my most common commit message is progress. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't I wonder if he'll get into I, probably not, but there's the whole thing with um conventional commits, I think they're called. Oh where you I loved like, reading we'll... that. Like it, it changed my mind the first time I read that manuscript. But then I never used it again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, for anyone, you know, watching or whatever, that it's like rules for commit messages, including emoji that have yep. like meaning to them so that you can read the commit messages and like know exactly what they're about. I have never come close to that. I do try to like, I try to do more than just say progress, but you know, it's the 14th commit on something will often be just you know like oh come on <laughs> you know <laughs> please, work. please please work <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, see i tried to write like i'll oh, change this functions this right. ring and stuff but like when you're really in the flow it's just i don't know it doesn't yeah. seem worth it and then i hate myself six months later when i can't figure out what exactly. i'm trying to do i yeah. i have adopted uh not always but often the practice of the um, was it repeated amend where while I'm working locally, I will commit and then, uh, you know, change some more things and then commit amend previous commit and just say, you know, what has changed or what all have I done so that when I actually check it in, it's just one thing. Uh, but that's dangerous because you have to make sure you know what has been pushed and what hasn't. Or right. It, can, it might be slightly counterintuitive because you don't keep history you keep rewriting his yeah like it's it you know there's a line somewhere where you'd want to stop doing that but if you're working on just right. one thing um you can that way you can commit before you're done basically and it doesn't feel like it's it's right. at least locally you're doing some version control mm. um i mean you, you can always yeah. stage but i feel like yeah. nobody does actually stage right uh, yeah. no one stages <laughs> <laughs> stage all write the commit and then there we go right so anyway, um, so so that is deploying to main now. Uh, oh, and it actually, it has deployed. So now now it's actually on production with the change. And I cleared out my uh, cookies, and so yeah, I'm not showing you, but I'm relogging in and to the main one, and it loaded. And if I check that log, let's see, uh, oops, logs. Yep, there it is, encrypting string. So now it's on production with the, the that message. So it was a good thing that this book has already pushed me to do. I So I have it set up on one of my apps, but the other app, like all of them right now have to, they have to like know where they are for some things in the code where they're deployed and getting that uh, between test and production is painful. And so I need, but you know, presumably worthwhile. And so I need to go through and do that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, 
now we can right. continue on with this week. <laughs> yeah, let's, um, I guess let's get moving because otherwise I'm not, one thing I would say is I haven't really figured out how long this is going to take. I made the <laughs> slides maybe a little bit uh, swifter than is advised. Um, so I didn't have time to do a run through, but I hope I've covered everything. Um, are you seeing my screen right now? Yep. Yes. I recommend yeah. doing like a, a control plus a couple of times just to get it a little bit larger. I, I need to one of these days update the font. On uh, these. We're going to get a couple of memes that are going to be pretty large, but I <laughs> think it's the trade off. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, okay. I mean, so I, I'm going to start with just saying like I thought last week's one was a really good presentation. It was really interesting. Um, so kind of bit annoyed that I volunteered for this one. Maybe I could have done one in the future and wouldn't have had such like a show to follow. Um, but I kind of did like try my best. I'm um, going to start with, we're going to come back to the learning objectives. Just, I think it's good kind of practice as well, kind of like the learning objectives is just to keep fresh of the top learnings that we've had before. I distinctly remember trying to remember these five tenets coming back to read them yesterday and being like, oh, what was that? Like, <laughs> I couldn't remember this stuff. So I think if these are guiding principles, then it's maybe a good idea to um, keep thinking about these. I'm not going to, I'm not going to reread them. I think it's just a, a nudge to maybe re everyone reread them occasionally just because they help you build the mental model of, you know, what DevOps is and what we're trying to do. I took kind of, I thought if I was only allowed to, pick three things and I kind of cheated because I picked three and one and then two more but I thought the most important kind of ideas was that you have separate environments um for in your development workflow and there was another one that is kind of like in between testing and production it didn't sneak in here and um, what was that called again uh staging oh, uh, right ah, okay so that's yeah see I thought I would have thought yeah staging is the, in a different place but yeah staging it so it's it's live but it's not live and then it is live kind of this yep. weird place that makes a lot of sense to have that um but then as i've mainly focused on r as well because i think most of us guys mainly focus on r using r live and github actions if someone has come out of the previous uh kind of book chapter or lecture video and doesn't know what any of these things are, it's definitely worth, I think, going back and looking at these. Um, and then servers as cattle. So like the idea that you servers are just disposable things, don't get too attached to them. You can make them up really fast and you can send them off to people. And um, that's not maybe the important aspect of DevOps. Like they're not, they're not precious things, which is quite nice. Cause when I make, uh, for example, in Python, my PyTorch environment, um, I hate having to update that because I'm on a Mac and I need the nightly build for the ARM Pro. And it's just a nightmare. I take that uh, like that little kind of server that I kind of have in my head is very precious that I don't want to mess it up, but it shouldn't be that way. I should be able to just destroy that, make it, and you know, come back to it, give it to other people easily. But the the learning objectives for today, so we're going to look at the three layers of the data science environment. Um, they are so package system and then hardware. And we're gonna look at why you need to control the package environment and perhaps what will happen if you don't do that. Um, we're gonna look at how you use Renv or so like the Python equivalent of them, but I'm actually not gonna use that um, very briefly. We're gonna talk about that, but that is in the book. So you can find that in the book but how to use RAM to control the packing environment. And then maybe when you need to go beyond the packing environment to the system environment, why do you need to do that? When do you need to do that? And that will be something that a little bit of discussion um, to hide my own lack of knowledge on will be very much welcomed. So when we get there, you guys are welcome to jump in. Um, okay, so I thought like, just to set the scene a little bit, what we could just kind of, come together look at our own experiences so who's used r who's used python who's used both and what do you guys think about managing packages in both um so i mean anyone who wants to jump in i uh, like um, oh go ahead john i was just gonna say, like i you know as i think we've talked about jack that like i rewrite things in r 
because I hate working in Python. <laughs> like, so <laughs> just hate managing Python environments. Um, I also just, I'm not as proficient in Python, but yeah, I, um, for the most part, I find uh, environment management in R to be far easier. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I super agree. I, and you know, um, one of the thoughts that somebody brought up to me was that for some reason, R environments just are not, most R users are not looking for multiple environment setups. I think. And I think that when you compare our users to Python users in the realm of, of data science, um, a lot of Python users are people who are looking for or who utilize this multiple environment um, paradigm because they're working on different projects that require different um, packages that have very frequent updates, packages that are that are very low barrier to entry um, with PIP and such. But for our users, most of what we use is um, is validated and 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 um, inspected by CRAN. So when we want to use a new package, the majority of the time an R user is going to get it from CRAN and know that it's not going to break their environment so to speak so i think that's that's probably why environment management it has such a a, a lower threshold in r um as compared to python Do, i don't know if you guys can uh, agree or reflect with that statement yeah i think so i i learned python first and i didn't know much or any computer science or anything and i thought there was just such a barrier of like stuff like working directories and file systems that you just don't have a clue about if you're self-taught and you're not right. getting formal schooling and i thought like why is it this hard just to like get into my REPL and write a bit of code and i just like right. get the libraries i want and when i turned to r and i started using r studio i was like oh this is just the best thing ever like, i can actually i can do the stuff i want to do and um, you didn't have to I change anything every time you start right. a new project yeah. And now I think yeah. I could manage the Python stuff way better because I'm a few years down the line and I understand this stuff. But I felt like it really sucked as a new user to Python. Yeah. I thought it was just a, a horrible feature. Um, and I guess for the DevOps kind of target market or target audience, we can deal with that stuff now. So maybe right. it's not so bad. But if you're thinking about just getting involved with packages and environments, I think R kills Python, like <laughs> destroys it. Yeah, it, it, the one that always cracks me up is, you know, they say uh, one of the differences between R and Python is in, in R, there are 400 ways to do anything. And in Python, there's one right way to do everything. That's like part of the, the culture. And I'm like, okay, cool. So how do I install Python? And you get 400 responses to that. And so, <laughs> <Never> wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, okay. So there's one right way to do everything except like using Python. <laughs> yeah. So that always <laughs> amuses me. Except arguably like the most important thing. <laughs> right. Being able to do something in Python. Um, yeah. So but no, good. It, I, I imagine we yeah. that's probably why all of us have used R so much more than we've used Python. Um, yeah. Because this thing, when you're not ready to deal with this difficulty, R extracts it away from you. Yeah. Whereas yeah. Python just says deal with it. Like <laughs> I should have had a deal You're with on your own. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's um let's take a little look. So uh kind of left this very blank. And uh, we're gonna look in a little bit more at each. Um, but mainly we're gonna focus on the package environment because as the book says, we as data scientists, we have most control of the package environment, and that is our domain. We might have system admins, IT different people who are going to take care of hardware and system, but we're expected to make sure that if we make a package or we make an update to a package, the people who need to use it just can use it. Um, so we will focus on that mainly, but we'll dip in to the others. Um, there are great visuals in the book about 
these things that I, as everyone's read it, I didn't necessarily see the need to put them in, but I feel like maybe I will retroactively add those things in. Um, just like the cheat sheets as well about like PIP versus um, installed up packages. But onto the package environment, this is kind of what I call like the data scientist life cycle. And I feel like everyone kind of went through this. It's you write first, like your first block of code pipeline that just does what you want. And it's just like, I'm a, I'm a God. I just made this thing. I'd hate to have to figure it all out again. Um, so what I did, and this is like kind of hilarious now looking back, I saved it in a Google Doc. Um, so it was live. And I could get in there, get to the Google Doc anytime I went to a new script. I didn't really like using the command line too much. Um, and then I'd have this Google Doc. It was like a repository kind of before I really knew much about GitHub. I was just putting all my code in there. And um, if I ever needed to send something to someone, I could just go and get it from the Google Doc. And life was pretty sweet. Um, it was a very uncomplicated time. But then you kind of like, you, you start working maybe professionally and efficiency becomes like paramount maybe. And you think, well, this is not ideal. Like I have to go and get this every time. So then you have to start plugging in new variables, new data. And you're like, okay, like I have to learn how to make functions. Um, and you make a function. And then like passing out your function every time you make a change from your Google Doc is just like ridiculous. and Maybe it took me too long to realize this, but eventually you realize you need to make packages that are portable, which is one of the key things about the package environment in DevOps, is that it's having that package means it can't be changed easily by things on the machine and it's you're able to transport it to other people. So you make your first package, and then I think you really do start to develop like a I am a real God complex. Like, this is amazing. I can send this to other people like everyone else can do to me. And then if you work in R, you plan some time to get it onto CRAN quite soon. But if you really work in R, it's just really soon. And then it's it's really, really soon. Yeah. And any day now. <laughs> 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 This is the honest data science mm -hmm. workflow or cycle of life. I have I, I have a couple on CRAN, and I, I think there is a lot to be said for just, you know, it's not as scary as you might have heard. I mean, sometimes <laughs> it is, but most of the time it's not as scary as you hear. Uh, but yeah, uh, like I went through most of those steps. I, I had, I went through the Google Docs step before R, I think, but equivalent for sure. And, and you know, like <coughs> using Dropbox for sharing things and mm. kind of version control, but not really. And um, yeah, so I, yeah, I really I like it. It's not as bad when you know how, like I, I've looked into it quite recently for the, the Hugging Face R package and mm -hmm. just there, there's, there's, um, not use this but dev tools kind of like check windows check linux mm -hmm. this kind of stuff do two of the three it's not that bad but it seems like something you never actually want to do but it does does kind of allude to a really important point that i think alex makes that stuff like cran and biconductor and r and pip conda all these things are so useful because they really they help us do a lot of this stuff um we maybe get on to a bit later where Alex recommends maybe not using Conda, for example, in production. Um, but when you're a data scientist getting started and you're on your road to having environments as code that are, you know pass all the tenets of DevOps, those things, they're great. Um, but then one of the things Alex kind of picked out um, was like this bit of code. So I have mixed feelings about this because I don't do this because I know it's rude and I know it's bad, right? <laughs> but also there are people in my team, say, or people who are not in my team, but the people we make scripts for, RMDs for packages, who they don't really know how to even install packages. Like they would love someone to just tell them, like, please install this package if you need to do this. Obviously, it's maybe we're a bit further along the line um, in getting into DevOps and stuff. And I understand the hate for it. Like you shouldn't change someone's system environment because of all the things we were going to look at in a minute. Um, but I did want to flag it as something that if you're like 
if your production is someone who knows no R, knows no anything, like sometimes you have to do these ugly things. I don't know what yeah. you have to think about that. No, I, uh, I, I totally agree. It's um, it's it's one thing to go the full Monty, right? And develop a package and develop a Docker image and develop, <laughs> you know, a, a website with all the things that you, you know, you can instruct somebody to um, use your your software. But on the other hand, there are are you there are legitimate users who just say, I just download downloaded R five minutes ago and I'm looking at the little R. They're not even looking at R Studio, they're looking at the little R terminal <laughs> and saying, Can you please just like make it work? I only need this for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, I mean, there is that line. Um, and, and line's not even right because there's all these little islands, you know, of sometimes this, sometimes that. For example, if you wrap everything that you're doing into a package and tell them to install the pa that package, you're effectively doing this with all of the dependencies of that package. You know, you're just mm. auto installing all these other things that your package depends on. Uh, well, uh, imports. Um, so yeah, there are definitely lines. I don't, you know, I, I don't like this particular way of doing things, but I can see that sometimes comes up installing packages uh that's a much better version of this type of thing than things like setting a working directory um deleting things you know things like that like please don't mm -hmm. randomly do that in your scripts yeah certainly don't make <laughs> yeah. changes that the person is not even not like would never consent to but not even implicitly mm -hmm. consenting to by like right loading yeah. your package yeah, for sure. I, I, I mean, it's the kind of thing, it's almost like it's like a wives' tale. The people in the know know why you don't do this, but to other people, it seems like maybe you do sometimes. Um, but I do agree, you probably shouldn't. Um, but then, I mean, I think Alex uses this <laughs> as an important cue in of like, well, the reason kind of you should definitely shouldn't do this is that this doesn't stop anything breaking later on. And right. one of the tenants, or some of the tenants of DevOps at least, uh, they were made to stop things breaking later on. Um, and if you don't set, say like, oh, that's a, that's a different slide actually. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll drop back to this moment and we'll look at that. I like to try and kind of uh, term something in my own kind of way. Um, and it's similar to the ingredients in the kitchen. Um, but so on this side, I was trying to think of my own little analogy um, just to see that I had the idea kind of right. Um, and one of the things with environments, so in you know, your uh, packing environment on your system or whatever, is that you don't necessarily want in a lot of places in life to do everything everywhere all at once, right? Like if you think of the rooms of a house, like you have different rooms in your house, they play different functions. And um, some of them could play the same function, but others of them like really can't play the same function. And you're limited by space. You can't put it all in everywhere all at once. So you probably wouldn't even want to, even if you could. Um, and so I was kind of thinking about environments. Um, so when you go on to why that becomes a problem, it's kind of something like this. It's like, stay in your house, you've got rooms that are just completely incompatible, right? It's like, you don't want the kitchen and the toilet together, not for style. It's like a very practical reason that you don't want those two things together. And they're just incompatible, like it's going to make you ill and all this stuff. When it comes to packages, and I think this happens way more in Python, so I've used some Python packages. But if you can only have one house or one environment and you need to do some computer vision on TensorFlow and you need to do, um, I don't know, let's say, I don't really use PyTorch for anything except Transformers, um, but you want to do some text analysis on PyTorch, it might be the case that the specific version of TensorFlow that you need um, has a dependency on NumPy, which they all will. And that version of NumPy is different to what you would need for PyTorch. And because, um, let me say, uh, in here we talk about, like, why can't we have multiple versions of the same package? And it's just a big, like, well, because you can't. Um, 
and it's just because no so i like the because no's because you can't question them uh you you have to deal with them and the reason is is that your packages get stored in a specific place uh that place is a slash library folder and within any slash library folder you can't have um multiple versions of the same package and i do still think in my head it's like well why can't i have multiple versions of the same package and it's just because no i'm sure there are some you know similar file names and whatnot that do mean it but in my head it kind of things like well, why can't that little folder in the package be like a project or a different environment and it's just called numpy 3.1a and i it's not mine's not the reason why uh, but it's good to know that that's why you can't uh, have both of those tensorflow and pytorch or if it's deep flyer or whatever um so i maybe haven't put in the presentation but that is important to think about is stuff gets deprecated over time so sometimes you do just absolutely have to have a version of deep flyer that has functions that are now deprecated because you don't have control over something that's been deployed in the past and it has to work and um, arguments have been changed functionality alex talks about uh, different environments have different standards of compliance and there are whole industries where you might have to be re able to recreate like the interaction with the machine so some c plus plus libraries that have had I don't know, floating point arithmetic rules changed or something that will throw out your error like your uh, experimental error in physics perhaps and you can't have that so you have to be able to completely recreate everything um which does make a lot of sense personally hope i'll never be in that situation um and that I'll be able to pass that on to someone who manages these things like fully professionally all the time, or maybe that will be me in the future. Um, but okay, so we've established that sometimes we cannot have all of the versions of a package that we need in the same place in library. So what can we do is instead of having multiple versions of the package, we can have multiple versions of library. Um, and we can store those libraries in different places. And Alex gives an example in the book uh, where he's used, I think it was uh, Renv initially, right, to make some different environments. And you can just see the, the directories that lead to the different libraries. And you can visually see that they're in different places. And then you can imagine, well, OK, if I'm putting all the packages in there, well, then I've got these different libraries. I make a different place for my library. Now I can put my TensorFlow in one, I can put my PyTorch in another. And yeah, now I have functionality for all the things uh, that I need to do. Does, does anyone want to jump in at this point and point anything out or? <laughs> uh, so, you know, we had the thing of, you. we tried to, or Jack tried to put uh, Renv into the book club repo, which mostly is a good idea, but I have some arguments against it. But the the way that the GitHub action set up, it doesn't know how to use Renv yet, and we had we would have to change that. And but the reason the argument I have for something like a book club is like it's a, it's a clearer argument. Like let's say you're working on a package that you plan to publish. Locking the package versions is only locking them for you. It's not locking them for your users. And so yeah. in that case, I think Ren is bad. Like you should be using whatever the latest thing is. And then, you know, you do the testing where you do different versions maybe or whatever, if, if that make, if that's important for what you're doing. And I, I weakly feel that our book clubs are the same thing that in the future, if some future book clubs using it, they want to know how to use the package as it exists now. And if our notes break, like they should break, like, and tell mm -hmm. them, Hey, these were built with an old version of this package and it worked, it doesn't work now. Um, but like, like I'm free to say that because I'm the one who would fix it. <laughs> so <laughs> there's that. Uh, and it does create work for future me. Um, and so that makes me think eh, maybe rent wouldn't be better. Yeah, um, it plays no it's... purpose in a book club. Um, right. I was well, just testing because we do rent. have it. 
we do have it happen where someone wrote something in notes and then the package changed and the notes don't work anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And someone, you know, like someone makes a change somewhere else and tries to deploy the notes and they fail. And they're like, I didn't even touch that. It's like, yeah, because it's loading a pack different version of a package. Mm -hmm. But like, say, I kind of like, so we should then fix that old, that thing in that other chapter to reflect the latest package. The way that happens the most is when we have book clubs, I mean, like this one, let's say that while Alex is writing this book, you know, he works at our studio, maybe he finds something in Renf that's confusing. And so then he like gets a change made in Renf that therefore the part of the book that talks about that, like that we have already covered becomes invalid. Mm -hmm. Kind of want to know that so that our slides <laughs> in the future <laughs> aren't saying this thing of how it used to work. Um, so it's complicated. Yeah, well, I, I, I wonder if Renv lock puts in the Rem version and then we could always fall back on, well, in the Rem lock, we had the old Rem version, so. <laughs> I think, well, yeah, actually, I'm, I think so. Uh, that's an interesting case of whether it does <laughs> or not. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, uh, that, yeah, anyway, so it, like, there, it depends on if the book is, like a lot of books are basically about a package or family of packages. And in that case, I think updating to the newest version just makes sense. Like it, it should reflect, you know, someone reading that book isn't, doesn't want to download a five-year-old version of that package. They want to download the package as it is now. So, uh, but for, for most use cases, totally. Yes. Use REM you get the lock and you get exactly the versions that of the packages that the thing was developed for but mm -hmm. things that are more live i think there are arguments to to let it you know yeah, let it I, break so that you know that it broke you know so that you can and it's a it. book there's no code yeah or really, you know, it's a book well, it's not yeah a package, yeah yeah it's almost like it's it's separate to the laws that it's kind of <laughs> right um, <laughs> um, right i i okay we're, we're kind of okay for time, but I'm yeah. going to, I think there's, there's a lot of space for a bit of discussion on, on this kind of uh, environments as code as a concept. So I'm going to kind of skirt over this. The, this stuff is essentially uh, taken from the image that Alex has in the book. So there's nothing too revolutionary. You could, everyone could find all of this stuff in the book. Um, but the, the idea when using REND is you should already be using projects if you're using our studio and if you're not you should be using separate directories that stand alone and are easy to get to i think probably most of us when we first used r had like untitled script you know like jupyter notebooks going up a serious amount and then looking at where like your tidy tuesday thing was and then the other thing you're doing like oh, it's all in this one r proj that doesn't have a name and um, and you learn from that it's definitely better to, to use the projects and um, but you, you make a project, you get inside it, you call rend in it in the same way that you initialize like a Git repository or whatever. And you probably find that it's actually automatically activated when you open our studio and you get into the um, R environment instead of virtual environment, I suppose. Um, and once you're in there, you, if it's not activated, okay, activate it and make sure you take a thing of this at the end, install your packages, get your snapshot, make sure you know where you put the project, it's kind of obvious, right? The working directory so that you, you know you can activate and everything. If you're not using our studio where it does it through the project. Um, but yeah, install your packages, take the snapshot. And this is what it will look like. It's some JSON, it's like a Python dictionary that just tells you, okay, well, this was the package, this is the version, this is the hash, so you can always go back and get it. And maybe when you see it like this, it makes quite a lot of sense. Like, it's nice that it's got the other requirements. Um, and yeah, it's, I, I feel like it's very obvious when you see it like this, and it's very useful. Um, so personally, I'm gonna aspire to use Ren for more because I remember, I think it's Philippe Massicop posted it a little while ago, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to start doing that. And then I didn't ever do it. So it's probably that way for a lot of people. Um, but okay, this 
this by itself maybe doesn't solve the problem of having portable environments that you can get to other users and that they can use. They still kind of have to do something. Um, and what they do is they need this rem block file, or if they're using Python, they need requirements.txt. If you ever tried installing repos, and packages and whatnot without knowing what requirements.txt is, then you have had a bad time. Like I can <laughs> assure you, you've had a bad time. Um, but yeah, sharing the environment, they can download the project from wherever you've hosted it or have you sent it to them. If they're comfortable with working directories, maybe it's a good idea to use set working directory, go to the link uh, or the, you know, the full um, directory and find the folder, open it up or whatnot. Probably though, for most of us, just use RStudio because opening the project just does this all for you. So you don't have to worry about this. Um, I was a little bit confused at this point. It's like it said to use rem in it. I guess a new user also needs to initialize rem, but I wasn't sure if I just didn't kind of understand this correctly. Um, try it out, see if it breaks stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and if not, then if this didn't happen automatically when you open the project, you need to use rend restore. And one of the things I think I, I think the, the the confusion is that rend init um, actually goes through the process of um, opening up your dot r profile file, um, which is where it writes uh, rend activate. Uh, so uh, rend activate is what accesses the lock file. Um, but anytime that you open an RStudio project, dot R profile is sourced. Um, and so that means that if uh, if activate is in your R profile, then anytime that you bring up the project, rend does its thing. So I think it, when you when you download somebody's project, the assumption is that you don't have their R profile file. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they recommend doing Rend init because Rend init will be like, do you have an R profile? If not, I'm going to start one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. nice. Yeah, makes sense. Um, probably maybe should have read that. Was that in the book or did you you just knew that? I I think I just read that from the uh, Rend init um, uh, uh, vignettes yeah okay nice and um, yeah that, that is that's the process sharing the environment then everything should be happy everyone installs the package i think alex put a note in about like okay you do this you send the project over but your package if it's a package doesn't get installed on the person's computer um so they still have to do that and it's maybe a little bit annoying for people because you think well it should um but i guess it's it's a small if you've come this far, it's yeah. a small step to just install the package as well. And um, that was kind of like a note on, on kind of, by this time, I was really getting short on time. So I was uh, <laughs> like, oh, I essentially quoted the book. And um, I've used Conda quite a lot. And I mean, again, at the start in different um, environments. So when I didn't have to work with other people and I was learning, I thought it was great it was perfect it abstracted away a lot of the difficulty that's having with python um but alex mentions that the reason it's so nice is that it combines a few different things so it can put together the package environment and the system environment and do things that you maybe want to do on your own local laptop but that you do not want to do in production um and this is certainly something that we could talk about further and um, but he recommends just taking the plunge, learning how to use in Python, then or the end, um, obviously in our RM. And I think that makes sense. If you've come this far in coding and you're getting to DevOps, like if you've got to learn how to not rely on something like Miniconda and Conda for software installation, then yeah, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and you'll save the people that you're serving stuff to maybe some problems, which is you know what we're all kind of after and then finally so this was i was trying to think of uh reasons or my past experience where you need to take control of the system environment 
we have to do that quite a lot in the hug and face R package because it's wrapping around Python through reticulate. We have to check a bunch of things. We have to add some dependencies. It's like maybe a little bit annoying. And Alex gives a case of some geospatial libraries where they are themselves calling system libraries. So you have to make sure that the change is not happening at that higher level of the package because it depends on the system level itself. Um, which to me made a lot of sense. I can't say I've used these geospatial libraries, but the idea makes a lot of sense. Remembering that the system uh, level depends on, oh, sorry, the package depends on the system, which depends on the hardware, um, which makes a lot of sense. There was talk in this part about Docker. Um, so I've used Docker a bit. Uh, I wouldn't profess to be an expert or anything. Um, and Docker, Colab, all these things do this kind of for you. Like they give you almost like a new system, essentially, that it's like a server pops up, pops in and out of existence. You don't have to deal with things. It will change its own internal system, like its own file system and stuff for you, which is nice. But as we had uh, number five coming up, Docker for Data <laughs> Science, I thought I would kind of pass the buck on going into Docker. So someone else will have to. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, there was uh, a recommendation from Alex, a further reading. It's what they didn't tell you about R. Um, so I don't know if you can see this part of the screen. It's a book by Jennifer Bryan and Jim Hester. I haven't read it. I haven't had time yet, but it's something I may be bookmarking to read. If anyone wants to, they will find it all. Yeah, they do uh, workshops about that too. Um, that I, I haven't, I also haven't read that one, but that's on the list that we'll probably do a book club of that because it's a good kind of baseline. <laughs> it seems like it's got lots of just how to are. Um, so. Yeah, I th do, you, do you find though that your list uh, is moving faster than the speed of light? It's like galaxies <laughs> that will never come back into contact, right? There's <laughs> all these books and then it's just inflation happens and the books just get further and further away from... So ones I will read, yeah. Uh, but if you know, if I can make a book club happen and then watch those videos at two x, then I can get some of these books that I wouldn't otherwise get to get to read. So, <laughs> so there we go. Uh, yeah, but yeah, there are so many, and then and you know, more being written. Like we had the um, interview with uh, Hadley Wickham for Advanced Star, and he talked about that. Um, his next thing is this, there's a tidyverse design guide and he wants to turn it into like an actual book where it's more, not just about like how code works, but about how to write good code. Mm -hmm. And I am like, I want to read that one and it only kind of exists right now. So I'm looking forward to that one a lot. Yeah, I, I, I like all, the look only a bit of how to write good code. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, there are things like yeah. not saving users time by using dot 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 to part like ellipsis to pass the select that I just always do because it seems easy. Yeah. Or I name the uh, like mandatory arguments so that I don't have to type them every time. Right. Yeah. And then it, again, that's like don't do that because other users, especially if you're using ellipsis too, don't do that. But I've just always kind of just done it and it's never caused too big a problem. But it's really nice to have someone say, like, uh, I get why you would do that, but like, don't do that. Well, and yeah, I think largely right now, the how it exists right now, it's mostly just the rules without going into that much about why. And so that's, I think, part of what I'm looking forward to is seeing him really explain, no, you think it's okay. <laughs> and, and most of the time it'll be okay, except then when it isn't, it's a real pain or whatever. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, yes, the RSTAT's <laughs> WTF. Uh, yeah. Definitely want let's, to read um, let's, let's take a look at the last slide. So, All right. what I did is I want to get <laughs> opinion uh, on this, and then I'll retroactively edit it. And it's like, what did we learn, or what did we discover? And are there things we didn't talk about, or discover that we do need to? And um, rather than me write, this is what yeah. you learn. So nod your head and say yes, kind of thing. <laughs> uh, so what What do you guys think about about these things? Uh, I mean, that first one, that's actually, it's not a great learning objective because it's just one question and yep, I can list those three. Like it's uh, right. Okay. It's a uh, package 
uh, system and hardware. There we go. So, um, so that one's good. I don't know. Anyone want to have thoughts on the second one? I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> the um, the section on avoiding uh, Conda and Python as as it relates to this mm -hmm. learning objective, the second learning objective. But I'm just kind of, I think I was just sort of surprised, really, that um, Alex took issue with, with like, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I can appreciate his reasoning, but I was just very surprised that, um, you know, controlling the package environment with something like Conda was ill-advised, because that I has been my bread and butter for so long. Right? Like, yeah. it's that it does something to the system environment sometimes, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is... That was like the weight of the objection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, I, I think I, I was just, I, I'm reeling a little bit <laughs> yeah. from that, from that learning, from that realization. <laughs> it's funny because there, there is still a little bit of fogginess or, or fuzziness on the line because, like the R version, okay, that is separate. But when you install certain packages uh, in certain environments, it'll install the system dependencies along yeah. with the package. Yeah. And so there is a fuzzy fuzzy line in uh ren for rn2 in some cases. Um but less so, I guess. Um and yeah, you know, I can understand. You want docker probably or something like docker, that's your system piece mm -hmm. and then packages separate. Um but I, I think we did, you know, okay, it's important to control the package environment because packages change and you want to make sure your code actually runs the way you think it's going to run. So yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, why it's always very distinct from system. It's a little, mm. little fuzzier to, to wrap my head around um, because it isn't always, you know, it's not always a hard line. Um, but, but I can see why, like you want to, don't use Conda, use Venv and Docker. Mm -hmm. And that's what Conda is doing is, you know, but that way you can look at each piece and, and, you know, use the yeah. same image for all these different things. And that way you, if you're changing the overall image, then you know that you're effectively changing the machine, you know, yeah. like the production server or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I have, I have I just have one question. Sorry for yeah, um, no, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not uh, <laughs> discussing as you because I have audio issues. Not know why. Um, so I find it mis some some kind of mis misleading uh, words in the Docker the Docker when he mentioned Docker because he said that Docker is um, infrastructure as a code configuration tool, and I don't think this is what really Docker are, right? Hmm. I think yeah, Docker you, as, you um, yeah, because uh, I think of Docker as um, just, it's like it's like a virtual machine. We will go into it uh, in chapter five or so. Um, yeah. I, think it's, I think of it as a virtual machine, but we don't have, uh, in a virtual machine, we have a kernel. So we, we build the whole, the, whole, the whole system with a kernel inside. So we have the, our local system and inside it we have another system but in in containers and in docker we we don't we rely on the kernel of the operating system the host uh, that's why it's very efficient to run multiple containers in the same device we are just relying on the kernel uh, we're not building a new one and uh, that's why it's easier to use docker and faster and also uh, consume less resources from uh, from the machines that you're working on. Um, so this is how I think of Docker. It's like a containerization tool uh, that you build a small system in it, but without uh, consuming a lot of resources. Hmm. So so like like Docker is, is not, you, so you're saying you wouldn't call Docker an environment management strategy it's only a like container and kernel management strategy yeah yeah 
um yeah that's i guess that's my thinking of it uh because if infrastructure as a code we talked about infrastructure as a code uh, in the last uh, session and mm -hmm. it was managing the infrastructure on the cloud i think i think this is mostly what meaning of the infrastructure as a code so are you are just um configuring all the stuff in the cloud in in the simple yaml file and right just managing the resources in the cloud uh, mm -hmm. docker is, is something else is like uh, building a virtual machine or something inside our uh, it could be used it could be configurable by an infrastructure as a code tool uh like we uh, we do this, I think, in uh, even in, in in GitHub Actions, we we somehow building a Docker image or a container in the GitHub Actions, and we set up all the stuff in it, so it's like container containerized the um, the packages, uh, the system packages, and the environment packages, all the mm -hmm. stuff in in a in a container, and we run all the con like the steps on these containers in the cloud, which is GitHub. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think I agree. Um as far as as far as using Docker for environment management, it's kind of like the it's a higher level um than just basic, you know, code versions. Um it's going down to the like the system level, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But does it not collapse into the same thing? Like, does it not, it fulfills the role plus more. So it's like the environment mm -hmm. management is subsumed by the virtual machine, right? But mm -hmm. they're, they're not necessarily, I don't know if, is it like a distinction without a difference kind of thing? Or what would break if you thought that Docker was environment as code? Also like taking care of hardware and the virtual machine, What what's wrong? with that kind of setup like conceptually or practically is maybe why because i don't know docker well enough don't necessarily get yeah yeah um i think mainly be, um is a conceptual part uh, they're not the practical uh, because um it's just not defining an infrastructure it's not defining an infrastructure we just build already built images we defined images on um a containerized uh, virtual machine so it's uh it's like we putting stuff in a container so it's a container we have a lot of stuff in it but we are not building the infrastructure i'm i'm talking about the naming the naming is maybe confusing for for the readers because there is an infrastructure as a code tools but it's not docker if you but docker, docker. Yeah. yeah so it, it's environment as code rather than yeah my, yeah my, yeah. I so if I if I said it's infrastructure as code, I maybe misspoke. And um, when I was I like highlighting this, um, but yeah, Alex definitely says it's environment as code in the book, I'm pretty sure. Um, but then does say that he will be talking about it a lot more here. So hopefully this yeah. thing, yeah. Because I, I feel like I'm I'm still a bit foggy on docking myself, so I can't I don't know if I've made the right clarifications. Um I think, I think even Docker yeah, professionals are foggy on Docker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a good tool to like to test your uh, your things on a on a local machine. Yeah. Um, we need to wrap up, but before we do, I just wanted to make sure to point out that we're off for the next two weeks. So next weekend there's nothing, and then the weekend after that is going to be the project club. And then the following week is chapter three, and currently nobody is signed up. Uh, what is chapter three? Data science project components. I can take it if uh, no one else is super uh, anxious to take it, but um, um, I, I would. I would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah pointing fingers. Yeah. Uh, All right. Yeah, I would take it. I, I I could take it, but I don't have the the data science background. Uh, as I already said, I. I laid on that engineering things, um, but yeah, I could take it. No, no problem. I will sign. Okay. Don't, don't worry about the design. Look at some of these slides. Like, yeah. there's no bolded text. Like, really, yeah. don't worry about the design. <laughs> Excellent. And like, 
if it, uh, I don't know, I think there's something to if a chapter is like, oh, I if you look at it and you're like, I know nothing about that chapter, that's the best one to sign up to present. Um, mm -hmm. because those are the ones yeah. where you know, yeah. when you present, you've got to you got to learn it well enough to talk talk about it. And so it it can be really helpful uh, to do that. So yeah, excellent. Um, and you've got three weeks, so plenty of time to prepare. <laughs> awesome. All right. Anything else? All right. I will see everyone. Well, hopefully I'll see most of you in two weeks, but uh, we'll see you for this in two or in three weeks. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving, <laughs> right? Soon for you guys. Uh, right. That'll be after, but yeah, it's end uh, of November. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. All right. Cool. Cheers, Bye. everybody.